Welcome to A Better HR Business, the podcast that looks at how HR consultants and HR tech firms grow their businesses and how they help their employers to get the best out of their people. Remember, for show notes and downloads, go to www.getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. That's getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. Okay, let's get started. Hello, welcome back. Great to have you along. And I'm really looking forward to today's conversation with Paul Falcone. Paul is a fascinating guy and a super nice guy with an amazing background, amazing history. We're going to dive into that in a second. But firstly, Paul, thank you very much for joining me today. My pleasure, Ben. It's great to be here. Yeah. You've been traveling around for the summer vacation, but where are you normally based? Normally based in Los Angeles. LA, brilliant. And that makes sense because as I alluded to in the intro there, that you've got an amazing background with a pretty heavy sort of focus, let's say, in the entertainment sector. So Paul was the former CHRO at Nickelodeon with senior HR positions and so on in Paramount Pictures, Time Warner and City of Hope. So fascinating stuff. I'd love to dive into that. I also want to learn a little bit about how you transitioned into the business world and how we incorporate book writing and so much more into that. So do you want to just give us a quick overview of your role as an HR leader within the entertainment sector? Yeah, within entertainment, for me, Ben, I spent about 10 years with Viacom, which was the parent company of Nickelodeon and Paramount Pictures. Yeah. So with Paramount, I was head of international human resources. And when the opportunity came up to join Nickelodeon as their head of HR, I was like, I'm all in. And it was fun. My kids were at the right age. You know, SpongeBob and all the shows were filmed right in the building where I was. Wow. So the kids got to meet everybody. So it was really kind of cool. I also worked at uh, NBC Universal overseeing HR operations. So think of their prime time and their late night shows, anything from The Office, Saturday Night Live, The Tonight Show, was a whole bunch of shows. So I've been on the live action side. I've been on the animation side. I've been on the corporate side of HR all the way across the, you know, the various divisions but also for me, it was healthcare biotech as well as yes. financial services because I wanted to be diversified. I didn't want to only be a one industry HR person. For me, I thought that diversification was important. Yeah. And in the end, it turned out that it was. So yeah. I'm glad I did it that way. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of that sort of diversification approach. I've got mining, oil and gas, consumer goods. So I agree. And then you learn what works in one place doesn't necessarily work in another and, you know, lessons you can apply and yep. some places where it's cost cutting, but others it's around, well, we've got plenty of capital. So how do you leverage that into different operations and so on? So Very well said. You got that. It's different. People are basically the same, but the reality is when the conditions and the, the background and the circumstances are so incredibly different, you're right. It's different motivators. It's different ways yeah. of holding people accountable. So it depends. Yeah. I mean, I'm from Perth in Australia, which is a mining and oil and gas town. I remember a group of engineers during the boom time. So employee attraction and retention. So retention was the big issue. And a bunch of engineers were getting pretty annoyed at the quality of the wine they'd been presented with pretty fancy bottles of wine. And it wasn't quite right <laughs> vintage for them. You know? so, yeah. So tell us about Paul Falcone, workplace leadership consulting. What is the work you do? So obviously there's workplace leadership, but there's so much more to it that the communications, executive coaching. Do you want to give us a bit of an overview there? Yeah, I wanted to be diversified, Ben. And I had been thinking about this for a long time. But last 4th of July, 2022, I launched my own consulting firm and I was scared. When you're three decades of getting a paycheck and regular benefits and all of a sudden it's like, okay, you eat with you kill. So good luck. <laughs> It was different. It was just a very, very different mindset for me. And yeah. it was exciting on the one hand and something I'd been preparing for, I think, for three decades in my mind, at least. But yeah, it's hard to make that transition. So for me, my verticals were, I do a lot of training and speaking at conferences because through the three decades, I'd been a column, I still am a columnist for SHRM, the Society for Human Resource Management. I've now written 17 books between the American Management Association and HarperCollins. And so I would speak at SHRM conferences and whatnot. And so I thought part of what I would do would be keynote speaking, because I like that, which kind of lends itself to special events, corporate offsite retreats and that kind of thing. So there was one vertical. Another thing was I decided I would get certified as an executive coach. To me, it's like that was kind of natural, obviously doing the teaching, which is what I'm best at in a group setting or for a small company or for a conference is just different than one-on-one, -on -one, but it's still teaching. It's still basically the same idea. So for me, I wanted that to be a vertical. And, you know, there are other things I can do too. I thought, well, you know, maybe I can do expert 
testimony, expert witness work and the legal thing. But I thought, no, nah, not too much, not too fast. Yeah. Just focusing on those two areas, the executive coaching and the management training, going into companies and then doing keynoting, I guess it's three areas. That was enough in the last year. I have to say, knock on wood, has kept me pretty busy. Yeah, exactly. I forget the book, but is it good to grade one of those about the hedgehog principle that the hedgehog can't run very fast and it can't camouflage itself, but it can roll into a ball really well and put some spikes out. So focus on (laughs) what you're good at. Focus on what you're good at. And those are the things that I love doing. Interesting thing was, so my last full-time job, I was five years as the chief human resources officer for an organization called the Motion Picture and Television Fund, which is a healthcare nonprofit. And in California, they know it as the retirement home for the people from the entertainment industry. (laughs) They wanted someone with entertainment and healthcare. And so I had that background. But going through COVID was really hard. I mean, COVID started in a retirement home in Seattle, in our country. And it's like, you know, taking care of the elders for those two years was really tough. So I ended up giving, you know, four months notice, found my replacement, trained my replacement, no drama. But that did it for me. I was ready. I was part of the gray resignation. That's it. I'm not staying until I'm 67. I want a 10-year run to do consulting and just focus on the stuff that I love doing the most. So I've been fortunate to be able to do that. Brilliant. So personally, I've helped a lot of people transition from the corporate world into starting their own HR-related business. HR might be recruitment or diversity and inclusion, belonging, et cetera. But you didn't just jump cold because, as you said, you'd written so many books, many of the main bestsellers, number one on Amazon for the HR-related categories and so on. So what is it that got you started writing in the first place and was it worthwhile doing? Oh, yeah, very much so. It informed my career. I knew that I wanted to work for name brand companies that people would know globally. That was important to me just because on the back of a book jacket, it looked better to say Nickelodeon and Paramount Pictures than anything else. I happen to live in Los Angeles where a lot of people work in the entertainment space because it's probably our biggest industry or at least one of them. And I just thought that would have a natural appeal. But even working in the smaller companies, the nonprofits, the Fortune 500, the international role, which is head of international HR for Paramount, All of it was to inform my writing because I love this stuff. And I know that sounds geeky, but I find the idea of leadership in different types of environments to see what works, what doesn't work is absolutely fascinating. And my wife was the one who said, don't work till you're 65 or you're 67. I know you, you're going to want to work till you're 90. Spend five or seven years building up your practice so that by the time you reach 65 or 67, you'll have a full practice behind you with established clients. And I thought... She's the brains in the outfit. I married up. And you know what? It was it was a great idea. And so I'm now one full year into it and I'm really enjoying it. I'm just doing stuff that I love doing. And it's a little bit like always being on vacation. So just saying, I'm having a fun time. I love it. I love it. And on the writing the books, I haven't written books, but I've written, for instance, training programs, workshops and things. I always enjoyed doing that side of things. And I found that when you're preparing stuff like that, or in your case, writing books, and I know you give keynotes and things like that, it kind of crystallizes your ideas and advice in a way that wouldn't necessarily happen if you're just going through the motions of doing a job. Is that fair to say? 100%. The expression is teach what you choose to learn. And so when I went through UCLA, I had my bachelor's and master's from UCLA in literature. So I had nothing to do. I didn't know what I was going to do when I graduated, but I ended up finding my way into human resources and I wanted to get my certification and they have a two-year certificate program. I went through it. A couple of years later, I decided I wanted to try and teach. Knock on wood, they let me start a program there. And I've been teaching with them for years. The catch though was the students would have the same questions. And after I'd hear that enough time, or the challenges in the workplace would be the same questions from the managers, there'd be an article in that, or two articles, or 10 articles. And then once I had a bunch of articles, it was time for a book. And that's kind of how it kept rotating for me. Whatever I was writing on came from the trenches. It came from what are the real questions that people have. And people will say, where do you come up with all the content for your books? And I'm like, believe me, I am not that creative. <laughs> this stuff finds you. It does. That book I had written on having tough conversations with your employees. I mean, I wouldn't have thought of all that. You just can't picture it until... A, you've done it and you've done it so many times that you realize there's an article in there. And then from there, you realize, wait a second, there's more than an article in here. There's a book chapter in here. And before you know it, it can expand. So that's really, it was just a circle. It just kept feeding itself. All the different environments I went to created the different kinds of books. Brilliant. Yeah, there are some 
brilliant HR groups on particularly Facebook, for example, there's discussions and my boss has done this or I've got an employee and the stories that come out are just brilliant. I can see that would just feed a lifetime's worth of books. What about the actual types of problems that you solve for employers? What are the challenges you help them deal with? They repeat a lot, man. I always say what separates my books is I teach the how. Everybody knows what to do. They just don't know how to do it, right? So this becomes your problem, whether it's the discussions with your employees, whether it's how to motivate your team, holding people accountable, having constructive dialogues, constructive confrontation. It's pretty much the employee life cycle. And I think what I see in my consulting practice is more of the same things. On the executive coaching side, it's a superstar player who's got serious, significant behavioral problems, right? Their performance is great, but their conduct is corrosive or it's toxic or whatever. But Paul, we really want to keep him or her. But the reality is unless things change, that shouldn't be the way coaching is done. Coaching should definitely come from building on strengths. But in my experience now, the practice is they'll call in a coach when they want to salvage the person, but they're frustrated. And so that's something to solve. When you're doing the management training, then it's a little different. It's bringing fire to the caveman. When you think about it, even if you have an MBA from a top 10 school, they do not teach leadership in the trenches. They're not teaching how to do that. They'll teach you organizational design, organizational behavior, organizational development. But what about the leadership? And we don't have that. And I think that's where my books have filled a niche. And that's why they've sold well. It's like if you want to have a tough conversation with an employee, grab that Falcone book, whatever it's called, right? Because it covers performance problems, conduct problems, reliability problems, all the different things that are real in the workplace. And when people are nervous and they need something to read, I don't tell them, look, use my words exactly. But what I am saying is listen to how the conversation plays out. Because I've done this conversation so many times, it'll likely follow the same way, but also make it your own so that you're comfortable opening that dialogue and giving them some choices on how to do that. So yeah. that to me was always the logic. And what I'm solving in real life is still what I've been solving in the books and the articles for all these decades. People have the same questions because everything is learned by experience. Figure it out on your own, which people can do, but they're going to step on landmines all the way through and expose the organization to legal jeopardy too, if it's done yeah. too egregiously. So the more I can get ahead of the problem, teach them the logic behind it, and these kinds of things, teaching them the how, giving them the words, it really tends to help. I remember when I introduced a sort of a capability and disciplinary guide to a business, and part of it was scripts on what to say in that session when you got the difficult employee. They thought I was a hero. The managers, the line managers, the ones who are in there going, I don't know what to say to this guy. So I completely agree that how is often such a missing piece. You know, speak for yourself. When I came out of college, I knew everything. So, you know, come on back down. But <laughs> I know with a lot of your books, people listening to this do check out Paul's books because some of them are just really practical and helpful. Conversational guides when you're dealing with this particular situation. It's very rare that you find something like that. It's normally about treat the person with empathy and guide them, which is great, but it doesn't help you in that situation in the moment. To your point, Ben, that's the why, right? Yeah. And then the, you make them go through training. There are two kinds of sexual harassment, quid <laughs> pro quo and hostile work environment, right? Which they can get right on the test. But then they go back to their office and they have no idea how to manage these things. I'll give them a script that says, let me tell you how you can do this and really eradicate this, but you have to come from your values. Values-based leadership is important. And I learned that at Nickelodeon from the general manager. He was the best boss I ever had. And he would sit with employees in new hire orientation. And this man was a legend in the animation business. And he'd say, you guys, I need you to understand what my big eight rules are. And as long as you understand these big eight rules, this is more important than what you're gonna get in an employee handbook or a policy and procedure manual or a collective bargaining agreement or a corporate ethics statement. I'm hiring you to perpetuate the culture that's so special to all of us at Nickelodeon. Wow. And then he'd have a follow-up conversation. That was on a Monday for new hire orientation. On Wednesday, he'd have a follow-up in his office for everybody who was in a leadership slash management. Wow. And again, he would talk about, again, as managers, these are my expectations. And you'd be surprised how that works. When people know what those expectations are, when you can put it in a context that's real, that they could use very easily, everyone feels good. It's almost like this healthy sense of, structure, there's this direction, there's this ongoing communication, but you learn about it right from the beginning. Yeah. And it's an easy trick, so to speak. I've recommended people who are showrunners who are introducing a new season of a show, 
to talk about what are these values. It's one thing to be successful. You're the best in your class if you're on this particular TV show. That's great, but that's not going to be enough. And coaching them to give these kinds of conversations makes them feel more confident, giving them a gift that they can pay forward, and makes the employees feel better. There's far less drama on those sets when people know what's expected of them. Yeah. So the drama goes into the right place. We want the drama in the drama. We don't <laughs> want the drama in the workplace. We're, we're good. <laughs> so what about the transition into the new business? You said oh, three decades in getting the corporate paycheck. You know, it's a scary moment for anyone. How did you go about when you... I don't know, turn the lights on. How did you go about getting the word out there about your new business and trying to get that first bit of work coming in? Yeah, three decades is a long time. But again, most of my network is in Southern California. So I don't know people, as many people globally, certainly, and not in New York or Chicago or whatever it happens to be. So a lot of it was getting words out to my immediate network and also LinkedIn. For me, doing the LinkedIn announcements really seemed to make a difference. Mm -hmm. A lot of people came back and said, oh, I didn't know you were doing that now. Good to know, Paul. We'll keep you in mind. Yeah. So I had that LinkedIn network already built up. And to me, Ben, that really, really helped. And the other thing I'll do is I'll reach out to people on LinkedIn who has a CHRO title and say, hi, I'm Paul Falcone. I'm the former CHRO of Nickelodeon, blah, 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 blah. And now I have my own consulting business. If you'd like to connect, if I can ever help with anything, feel free to reach out. And some accept my invitation and some don't. And that's okay. You know, you just don't know. But I didn't want to do cold call. I knew I wasn't comfortable in that. And my approach to business development has always been, how can I help? Even the idea of taking people in the same industry and introducing them to one another so they have their own networks within their own business, you know, field, that's important. HR people, like anyone else, we're busy. And we don't necessarily have the time to go to the luncheons. So sometimes just saying, you know, I'm happy to introduce you to this person who's kind of at this company that I know you know the firm, but in case you haven't met each other, I'd be happy to do an email introduction. Those things are nice for me. That to me is giving a gift. And I think they'll always remember who was the person who, you know, brought them together. That's more comfortable. That's more my style for doing new business development. I like that. Yeah. So it's that relationship building, making connections between people and strengthening that, which is so important. And also letting your existing network that you've hung out the shingle, you're open for business and just doing it in an informal, but friendly or helpful way in some cases. And I guess one challenge some people have on the LinkedIn front is that it's just so big or there's so many ideas. You've got experience in so many different areas. What do you talk about? How do you not get overwhelmed when trying to work out what to say on LinkedIn? Well, you only have so much space when you're doing an introductory email, right? So I kind of keep it short. I try and leverage my credentials. When people see CHRO of Nickelodeon or former CHRO, that means something. I mean, people will at least pay attention to that. So that's an advantage that I have. Other people have other advantages. Whatever your advantage is, that's your first sentence. Yeah. And then to then say, what I'm now doing is this. And if I can ever help with anything, or if you'd be kind enough to keep me in mind, if you hear of anyone who may need of my services, I'd appreciate it very much. Thanks, exclamation point, Paul. There you go. And there's an email. And I think for some people, that works. Other people may say, well, you may have been an HR person, but now you're a vendor and no thanks. And I'm okay with that too. What do you, you know, you can't control everything. But the thing that's so cool about LinkedIn to me is I can identify people by their title and I'm industry agnostic. I don't really care what size of the company they're in either, Ben. I mean, I've been doing work for very small startups that just got their venture capital funding to Fortune 500 companies. And it all depends where the network is. So if people that I know from a Paramount Pictures call me up, boom, now I'm at a Fortune 500. But if someone who I worked with Paramount, worked at Paramount with 20 years ago, is now at a startup company, boom, now I'm in that space. I've gone from, you know, restaurants to high-tech manufacturing, to biotech. I mean, I'm all over the place, but that's what I'm loving so much about consulting. Much love, is like yeah. you're helping people solve solutions in very, very different and very, very dynamic environments. And that's a challenge for me that I'm just really excited about. It's nice to be so excited. It's like, I feel like I'm in a new job and I love my company. That's <laughs> it's like, so yeah, good. it's kind of Paul Falcone, Inc., but it's that kind of idea. Yeah, I love it. And you said that, when you're sending these emails or LinkedIn messages to people and some say, yeah, that's great. And others say, no, you're a vendor, go away. That's cool in itself because back in the corporate world, we couldn't choose our bosses. It was just, that's who we get. But when it's your own business, that's great that they are self-selecting out. 
maybe we don't necessarily want to work with the person whose instant reaction is your event to go away because we're all just people. So that's one thing. I think it's great that you can choose who you work with for one. And then secondly, I think people sometimes forget in the world of HR leadership, et cetera, that when you make an impact with a person or a business, it then has flow on effects. If you help them improve their communication style, their leadership style in a positive way, the flow on effect even flows onto the employee's families and all kinds of stuff. So I can see the smile you had when you were describing all that. So you have a huge impact. Totally agree. And the thing too, is you feel like you can change lives. I've always said leadership is the greatest gift the workplace offers because it allows you to touch people's lives, build their careers, pay it forward, build more leaders in turn. When you look at that, a lot of this stuff is just changing your perspective on what you're doing. I don't ask people to totally reinvent everything. That would be silly. But it's like, look, your house is okay, but look at the foundation. Maybe there's a couple of bricks you might want to replace. And let me kind of share with you what you might want to replace them with. And the funny thing is, if you're putting some healthy bricks in an older or established foundation, and I shouldn't use bricks with the idea of flowers growing, but it does kind of grow. Yeah. It's built on a healthier foundation and they start to feel better about themselves. And my goal is if I can make you feel more self-confident about what you're doing in the business world, believe it or not, it has a personal world impact too. It really does. If you know how to have conversations with your employees, you're going to have a better understanding of how to have conversations with your kids. It's just that same kind of thing. And the only other thing I'd say, Ben, is we make it so hard because we tell ourselves, tale, well, you're a manager now, so you don't need anyone's help. You should be able to do this on your own. Baloney. Leadership is a team sport. You need to know where to go to get ideas. You need to know who to share things with when you're concerned about something. You're not an island. And the truth of the matter is, in a very simple exercise, I tell people in my classes, the first question is, would you want to work for you? I do want them to think about that. The second question is, tell me about your favorite boss and what made that person so. And they start raising their hands and they say, my favorite boss was someone who trusted me, made me feel like my opinion mattered, I had a seat at the table. Then the next person says, my favorite boss is someone who challenged me to do things I didn't even think I was ready for. She seemed to have more faith in me than I had in myself. Where we're going with this is, what makes someone your favorite boss is simply who you are, not what you do. If you come from a standpoint of caring and character, those are my two words, You respect them, they respect you, and you care about them. Just set the space up for them to thrive. They're going to figure out their own way to do this. And then 20 years from now, they're going to say, you were their favorite boss because you gave them the room to learn. You were there like a parent. It's kind of like that roots and wings, you know, as they say, I had the roots. I understood what was expected of me. And Paul certainly had high expectations, but he gave me the room to find my way. And he was there whenever I needed him to course correct or run ideas by. That's it. Forget micromanagement. You don't need to do the work for them. These are adults, but you do have to be able to give them the space to find their own way. And when we kind of simplify things like that, I think people start to see the wisdom in this as opposed to the grind of it all, the exhaustion of it all, the ongoing crises. It is hard these days. I get it. I've got a new book coming out next week. It's called Leading Through Crisis. It's that same idea. There's been so much, especially since COVID, and still so much coming at us. But the reality to me, Ben, is give them the simple truths, help them reinvent themselves and feel like they can build their self-confidence. And it does really improve their lives overall. Absolutely. There's powerful advice there. And also for people listening who might be running HR related businesses with their teams themselves, because that can have that huge flow and effect. Kind of feeds into my next question, because I think people watching this, listening to this, realize you've got so much wisdom and advice to share you have actually bottled a lot of that up and have created a pretty powerful YouTube channel where you've been interviewed all over the place and you've kind of pulled it all together and you've got some other interviews and talks and things like that. What made you want to, I don't know, share some of that in the online world of YouTube? Because, you know, writing, it only goes so far. I think the videos make a big difference these days, especially if they're short ones. I mean, some of them are 90 seconds and some of them are podcasts, but people collect their data different ways. Some like to read a book, some only want to read an article, and some would rather listen in the car. And there's different ways to do it, depending on how you learn. So I just thought that was too important a landscape not to pursue. And I'm enjoying it. I'm having a great time. I'm still learning how to put, (laughs) put things on YouTube. I'm mastering that. I'm also learning how to do a blog on my website. So I'll be announcing the blog pretty soon, too. But you know what? Again, It's cool because I get to reinvent myself. I get to learn all this new stuff. It does feel like it was 35 or 40 years ago when I was, you know, getting out of school and kind of 
wow, the whole world is your oyster. It's really kind of a fun time. So having gone through what you've gone through in terms of the transition into the new business and creating and winning new clients, doing marketing, et cetera, notwithstanding all of the books you've been writing and you've got the new one coming up, which we can get the details of in just a moment, but what advice would you have? Any lessons that you might share for other people running their own HR related businesses, maybe things to focus on or avoid? What are your overall bits of advice there? First, I want to be Ben when I grow up, just so you know. I think everyone should just try and be you and life is going to be much easier. No, but seriously, keep it simple and have fun. We need to lighten up. I mean, we have to be the voice that calms the room. We've lost the ability as a society to sit around the campfire and pass wisdom down to the younger generation. We're all too busy. We're all looking at our phones. And the funny thing too, Ben, what a lot of people don't realize is when it comes to Gen Y, the millennials, the 45 and under crowd, and the Gen Z, the Zoomers, the 25 and under crowd, these are the two most studied generational cohorts in world history. We know everything about them. But the thing that's scary is the Gen Z, the kids, the 25 and under crowd are testing out as the most isolated, the loneliest, the most depressed generation on the planet, even more so than people in retirement homes. COVID didn't help because with everyone working remotely, it only exacerbated a problem that already existed. So the reality is, if you think of what I call selfless leadership, this idea of make of your life a gift pay it forward. What can you do? And career and professional development keeps coming up as one of the top five things that Gen Y and Gen Z want. What does that look like, especially in terms of your 25 and under employees? How can you help them? They didn't grow up with the same socialization as prior generations because it was all digital. And as a result, they're suffering from that. If you just keep it through that perspective, just looking at it through that lens, where's the gift? How are you making it a better place for these younger professionals? And how do you go out of your way to become their favorite boss? It's a very, very simple prism because if they can say, Paul Falcone is the best boss I've ever had, that carries with it everything, employee engagement, employee satisfaction, employee discretionary effort, creativity, innovation, it's all there because you're making it safe for them to be themselves. You're helping them build their own self-confidence. And what better is that? I mean, that's really why we work. I have paychecks and benefits. I get that. I understand that. But really, what's the difference that we make on the planet? And you can't just look at that in terms of your private life. You have to look at it in terms of your business life. My argument is be successful through people, not despite them. And when you can look at it that way and figure out where's the gift that I'm giving, it just puts it all in perspective. And perspective is everything. Final thought for me is change your perspective and you'll change your perception. And what I mean by that is if you change your perspective, if you change the way you look at something, you'll experience it differently. Yes, it still may be hard. Yeah, you still may get laid off. Yeah, you can lose your job, blah, 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 blah. But you're going to see it and experience it differently because you have a healthier perspective going through it. Getting laid off is a rite of passage these days. It's just not that big a deal. But at the same time, it can be really, if it's the first time happening, especially, it can be really painful. Get people to look at things from the 30,000 foot view. Help them have perspective. Get them out of the weeds. That's your job as a leader. And that's what a staff meeting is about. That's what a one-on-one -on -one meeting is about. That's what a quarterly professional development meeting is. These are opportunities for people to thrive. And you won't know unless you ask. So my job is to help you have the words, the questions, but again, caring and character. That's really where it all comes down to. It's that simple. We shouldn't make it any harder than that by telling ourselves these other stories that are, I hate to say it, but they're nonsensical and made up. Again, would you want to work for you? And if the answer is yes, I'd love to work for me. You're doing everything the right way. Keep it simple. And if your answer is, well, sometimes, I don't know, not really, then there's probably something there that needs to change a little bit. I'm sure I'd love to work for me. I'm wonderful. But no. So Paul, if people want to learn more about you and about the business, Paul Falcone, Workplace Leadership Consulting, and about the new book, the videos, et cetera, what should they do next? Thank you for asking, Ben. So my website is just paulfalconehr.com. It's pretty simple on that one. Or you could look me up on LinkedIn. You know, LinkedIn, obviously, is just Paul Falcone one or you can find my books on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or wherever fine books are sold. So I uh, just pop my name in there. But the last name is Falcone. It's just like Falcon the bird, except there's an E at the end, which, yes, makes it Italian. So there we go. <laughs> Got it all explained. So if you're listening to this on the go, check the show notes. So it's paulfalconehr.com. We'll also have Paul's LinkedIn and to the books and to the videos, etc. And then finally, what's the name of the book coming out? Okay, it's called The First Time Manager leading through crisis. Then there's a book called The First Time Manager. 
And HarperCollins is building out under that umbrella. They're building out the first time HR manager, the first time sales manager. But they wanted a book, and I'm writing the HR one right now, but that'll be out in the spring. But they wanted one that can pair with all the other ones. And they said, what can we write? And I said, oh, I got it. I don't even have to think about it leading through crisis. And they laughed and they said, why? And I said, because everyone like me feels like their hair's on fire. There's not enough time. You know, we're building the plane while we're flying it. And how do we give managers the tools to get through these really, really hard times of tremendous change and disruption and crisis? And they loved it. So that book comes out on September the 5th. Excellent. We'll update the show notes to have that when that is released. If you're listening to this ahead of time, otherwise, yeah, go check out the book now if it's already been released, if you're listening to this in the future. How exciting. So, Paul, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed our conversation. You shared some great insights, and I wish you all the best for you and the business in the future. Thank you, Ben. Likewise, it was a pleasure. Thanks for joining us today on A Better HR Business, the podcast that explores the world of HR consulting and HR tech businesses. For show notes and downloads, go to www.getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. That's getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. Remember to subscribe and share the show with any friends who are busy growing a HR business. Thanks and see you next time.